Tonight on CBS 6 News at 11, Troy police investigate a body found in an abandoned building, shedding light on an issue residents say they're concerned about. Plus, we'll show you how the Niskayuna community came together to help a four-year-old with anemia and what they contributed to do so. And Bruce Springsteen watch continues with the boss performing Tuesday. We'll tell you what happened today, which might put his performance in jeopardy. Next on CBS 6 News at 11. CBS 6 News starts now. That's right, we start with the weather this evening with a live look over Glens Falls. Good evening, everybody. I am Tom Eschen. It's, uh, it's an interesting time for us. We're just moving on from a storm with possibly, and I think we know that there's probably more coming in. Let's get to the meteorologist, Craig Adams, for more. Hey there, Tom. Well, the storm that brought the snow into the entire area last night, or at least most of it, has gone by the wayside. You can see the skies have cleared out. The storm is now out into the Atlantic, so we're fairly clear now. It's quiet for the time being. Look at how it looked this morning on Barnesville Road in Skill. Really a uh, nice looking winter painted landscape there. Thanks to Donna Myers for that pretty picture. Got another one from Roxbury, Patricia Ormiston getting that view there from the snowfall down in the Catskills this morning. And another one from Michelle Cato along Route 28 in Phoenicia also looking very wintry. There was less snow here in the immediate capital region compared to the Schoharie Valley and into the Catskills, but all areas are under a winter storm watch starting Monday afternoon right through Wednesday morning for what could be our biggest storm of the winter heading in our direction. Looks like it's gonna be a high impact storm. We've got snow and rain developing Monday, probably more rain initially in the valleys mainly snow in the higher terrain, but then Monday night, the rain transitions to all snow and continues into Tuesday. It becomes windy, and with this type of snow being very heavy, wet snow and the winds blowing, it could lead to power outages. Right now, that looks like a likely scenario. So this is going to be, I think, not only a high-impact storm, but it could be our biggest storm all winter as a foot or more is looking likely in many areas. All right, we'll talk more about that coming up in a few minutes, Tom. Well, what better time to get your CBS 6 Weather Authority app to track all of that? Find that in your app store by searching WRGB. New tonight, a stabbing incident reported in the village of Husick Falls. Husick Falls Village Police Department confirming the stabbing took place at a Cumberland Farms gas station on Church Street. Police say they found a 22-year-old man with a stab wound. The victim has been transported to Albany Medical Center for his injury via helicopter. The suspect accused in the stabbing has since been arrested, but police note there's no threat to the public. The investigation does remain ongoing at this time. Meanwhile, an investigation underway after a Capital Region man was found dead inside an abandoned building in Troy on Friday night. Investigators believe the man was using the building as a place of shelter, and now residents are sharing their concerns about abandoned properties in the city. CBS 6's Emma Quinn reports. Roughly 200 abandoned properties plague the neighborhoods of Troy. Friday night, a man was found dead in an abandoned home on 8th Street near Husick. A particular building last night had a red X on it. That means it's not safe for firefighters to enter. There's a structural compromise, there's stairs missing, there's a hole in the floor. X marks the spot for properties like these, shown here on the city of Troy's vacant building registry. The fire and codes departments inspect these buildings every year. Public Works boards it up, they screw plywood on, doors, windows and everything. And the city is able to demolish abandoned buildings if they pose a safety concern. But it isn't always that easy. Carmela Mantello, city council president who's running for mayor, says two years ago the city set aside one million dollars in ARPA funds to combat the vacant buildings. She wants to see more be done. We've had a couple emergency demolitions, but not enough. Um, I don't even think we've spent maybe a hundred thousand dollars of the one million dollars that we appropriated two years ago. City Council member Emily Men says the buildings are a safety concern for all residents. Troy has dense neighborhoods with a lot of row houses, especially in, you know, our historic parts of the city, all the way from South Troy through Lansingburg. 
And, you know, if one building goes, it could take out the whole block. Those safety concerns echoed by fire department members. Oftentimes, the homeless community will seek shelter in the empty properties. These buildings have no power, no gas. So, um, you know, they, they may start a little campfire around them to try and keep warm and keep it snuff, but sometimes those get out of control. City and fire department members ask the public to report any suspicious behavior at abandoned properties. The codes department will come assess and can help direct someone in need of support to those resources. In Troy, Emma Quinn, CBS 6 News. Thank you, Emma. For the first time in three years, the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Albany held on its originally scheduled day. Despite some snow, as we saw, making its way to the capital region last night and into the morning, the parade went on as planned. The parade consisting of multiple charitable groups this year, led by the Albany Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians an Irish Catholic organization dedicated to charitable causes. Everybody seemed like they had a pretty nice time out there today. Pretty cool. Well, it's a busy time, as you know, in the capital region these days. Bruce Springsteen announcing yet another postponement, though, of a show from his 2023 tour. Now, according to Springsteen's team, it's due to an ongoing illness. The show postponed was scheduled for tomorrow night, Sunday, in the Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Capital Region's been anxiously waiting for Springsteen's return to Albany on Tuesday night in the MVP arena. Now we don't know if maybe snow could have an impact there, too. If you had tickets, though, for the performance tomorrow at the Mohegan Sun, their team says to hold on to them. The postponed dates will be announced soon, and we'll keep an eye on what Bruce does for Tuesday. Well, it's the beginning of March. Warmer sun, but cold nights, a recipe for one thing, sap and lots of it. A big celebration of everything maple at Indian Ladder Farms in Altamont took place this afternoon and will also continue tomorrow, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. We heard from the farmers hosting the All Maple Weekend today on what customers can expect. We've got maple beer, we've got maple cotton candy, we've got maple demonstrations, we've got maple cider, we've got maple pierogies, we've got maple infused pork chop on the grill. So if you like maple, today's the day to come to Indian Ladder. A maple pierogi, how about that? There will also be live music, guided hikes, food specials offered again during tomorrow's Maple Fest. And when you're done eating all of that maple, you might as well go get an ice cream cone at that point. Today, the Snowman Ice Cream Shop reopening for its 70th year in the city of Troy. Since the early 50s, the snowman has served the Troy community with various kinds of dairy treats, including hard ice cream, frozen yogurt, we were able to catch up with the fourth generation of owners for the snowman who tell us how much it means to have kept the shop in Troy throughout the decades. We are actually the fourth owner of the snowman. We just took over last year. Right. Uh, we're the guys from the Old Daily. Uh, we've been around for 48 years now yeah, in business here time, in Troy. And time. this was a Troy gem that we, we would have always loved to own, and it just came our way. And... Uh, by the grace of John Murphy and his wife, the former owners, uh, we were picked, and we love being here. And it is just, we were here as kids, so yeah. for for us, it's a, it's a gem as yeah. well. As for a lot of other people, as you yeah. can see, it's awesome. The Snowman has nearly 30 different flavors of hard ice cream, along with its standard fare of soft ice cream flavors as well. It's 11:44, and I'm starving. Coming up, it's the biggest failure of U.S. financial institutions since the financial crisis in 2007. What we're learning could be next for Silicon Valley and the bank in California. Next. Well, it's been three years to the day since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 outbreak a global pandemic. Since then, the virus resulting in nearly 7 million deaths worldwide. But with the pandemic largely over, many Americans have resumed a new normal life after the distribution of vaccines, at-home COVID tests, and immunity derived from infection. Unfortunately, many are still feeling the impacts of the pandemic, such as those suffering from lingering symptoms of the virus known as long COVID and many other lasting economic effects from the businesses shutting their doors in March of 2020. Developing now, three women from Texas are missing in Mexico after they crossed the border last month to sell clothes at a flea market. Family members say they have not heard from Marina Perez Rios, her sister Martisa, or their friend Dora Sines since February 24th. The three were traveling to Nuevo Leon, which is about a three-hour drive from McAllen, Texas. 
State police and the FBI are investigating along with Mexican authorities. Their disappearance comes just days after a Mexican cartel allegedly kidnapped four Americans and killed two of their captives. California Governor Gavin Newsom says he's in contact with the White House and Treasury Department as banking regulators work to stabilize the situation after this week's failure of Silicon Valley Bank. Christian Benavides has more from Miami. This week's rush to pull money out of Silicon Valley Bank sparked the largest failure of a U.S. institution since the 2007 financial crisis. California and federal regulators seized the nation's 16th largest bank's assets, transferring them to a newly created institution. It's expected to start paying out insured deposits on Monday. The plan is to sell off the rest of the assets to make payouts to other depositors. We rely on SVP as our bank to move money um, on behalf of our payroll company into the accounts of our employees. The key question is, are those funds going to move as planned on Monday morning? That's uncertain. California Congressman Eric Swalwell issued a statement saying he's heard from, quote, scores of constituents who have not received their paychecks because of this crisis, putting their mortgages and financial security at risk. Working to reassure Americans, Biden administration officials said Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is watching the situation closely. Our banking system is in is in a fundamentally different place than it was, you know, a decade ago, and that the reforms that were put in a place back then uh, really provide the kind of resilience that we'd like to see. In addition to startup businesses, established companies like Shopify, Pinterest, Etsy, and Roku are feeling the impact. In a filing Friday. Roku said about a quarter of its cash, nearly half a billion dollars, was deposited at Silicon Valley Bank, adding it was largely uninsured. Cristian Benavides, CBS News. All right, time now for our weather authority forecast with Craig Adams. And now we talk about the concept of time as it usually comes <laughs> this time of year. We don't have to get too deep. We just know that the clocks are going to be changing. That's right. It's the <laughs> night that we all get short change, yeah. that hour of sleep. And that's going to happen here at 2 a.m. Yeah, when yeah, we it's go not too back far away. So we're going to we're going to start pushing yeah. ahead, right? Going and that's back what we're to daylight do. saving yes. time okay. here. Let's go ahead and take a look again at what we will be doing here within the next couple of hours. As at 2 a.m., it is the official start of daylight saving time. All right. As we move beyond changing the clocks. We're looking at things right now pretty quiet in downtown Schenectady on our Fryhofer Skycam. The temperature in the upper 20s. Skies have cleared out nicely after having the clouds about the area and of course the snow last night and into the early morning period. Right now as we look at things in Glens Falls, temperatures in the upper 20s and skies are mostly clear. We've got a lot of the areas across northern reaches of our area already down into the low 20s in and around the capital region it's hovering around 30 degrees so we'll drop a few more degrees tonight it'll be rather chilly out there the system that brought the snow last night and into the early part of today is now well offshore so we've got a brief period of clearing here before the next system takes aim at us and as we talked about in our main weather this could turn out to be our biggest snow event of the winter so far What's going to happen is this system is going to transfer its energy down along the mid-Atlantic coast and we'll see another storm taking shape here. And that's the one that's going to end up heading in our direction, bringing what looks to be quite a bit of snow. Now, eventually, or I should say initially, it's going to start off is probably a mix of snow and rain in the valleys and then become just rain for a while. Higher terrain areas should be mainly snow during the day Monday. Monday night, as the storm starts lifting further northward, the air mass will chill enough in the valleys where it turns to all snow. Then this system is going to be coming up eastern Long Island right into the Cape Cod vicinity and then just kind of meander out here Tuesday with the snow continuing to fall, the winds blowing. And again, this type of snow is going to be that heavy stuff and very well could lead to power outages all around the area because of the wind and the combination of that heavy snow. Let's look at the hour by hour forecast. Got a decent day tomorrow coming up for us at least. Sunshine mixed with clouds. And as we get further into the day, we expect a little more cloudiness to start coming in. Tomorrow night, the clouds will be thickening up. 
Some snow showers start developing out to our west, and then early in the morning, we may see a few snow showers starting to develop here locally. And then a steadier precipitation developing as we progress through the morning. And again, note how the Hudson Valley will likely be going over to rain and continuing with rain into the afternoon while the higher terrain areas are going to be snow. But once we get into Monday night, after 9, 10 o'clock, it's going to start transitioning to all snow. And this snow is going to continue through Monday night. And with that storm just kind of circulating out over Cape Cod, the moisture will keep coming in, making the whole, the entire day Tuesday snowy. And as we said, with increasing winds. So right now, we're saying that this storm could provide at least a foot of snow for most of us. And that is going to be that heavy, wet snow out there. All right. Get ready for it. Partly cloudy skies, 20 to 25 tonight. Into the day tomorrow, it's dry, seasonable temperatures, upper 30s and low 40s. We've got the weather alert icons up for Monday and Tuesday. Again, the main part of this storm is going to be coming in for Monday night, not so much during the day Monday, and then continuing into Tuesday. Wednesday, a few leftover flurries, but it's pretty much done with. Breezy, and it looks dry for Thursday and Friday. Friday, St. Patrick's Day, and temperatures a little milder. By Saturday, we could be looking at another storm, but that one looks to be rain. Tom? Thank you very much, Craig. Still to come tonight, we're talking new technology for hair loss. How a robot is being used to give you your hair back if you need it. Stay with us. New tonight, breakthrough technology could help those struggling with hair loss. Medical reporter Liz Bonus explains how it all works. Hey there, hello to you. This new technology, a robot that can help simplify hair transplants to help beat baldness. The befores and afters can be pretty dramatic from a hair transplant. Mark Lucas said when he had his years ago, they basically cut me from ear to ear in the back of my head. But now, rather than having to take a strip of that hair and move it from the back of the head to the top or wherever else you wanted to grow, the robot changes all that. Dr. John Mendelson of the Advanced Cosmetic Surgery and Laser Center says the robot is programmed to find and select tiny pieces of the skin known as grafts with healthy hair. It removes them and then allows them to be placed where you want the hair to grow. And right behind me here, you can see the artist robot is with more precision and uh, it, more adeptness. It's, it can harvest 2,000 grafts per hour. So you're seeing our technicians clean the grafts as they're being harvested. And what the harvest means is we're going to borrow donor hair from the back so that we can place it where we want in the recipient area. That means a process that would usually take hours by hand is significantly shortened. But by allowing the robot to assist us, it allows our technicians to more precisely spend their time placing the hair. All this new technology recently led Mark Lucas to have a follow-up transplant. But I still had some areas. I still had some areas up here that uh, were a little thin. Mark mostly wants to cover up some of the back scars and improve what's on the top of his head. The new hairs are just now kind of starting to grow. It's been four months. It takes about four months for the new hairs to start uh, growing. And, and I can feel, I can feel thickness all through here that I didn't have before. These transplants can range in cost from about five to $20,000. Most of the time not covered by your medical insurance plans. I'm medical reporter Liz Bonus. Now back to you. The town in Iskayuna partnering with the Gift of Life organization for a bone marrow match drive today to help a life-saving find a life-saving marrow match for a four-year-old. That four-year-old's name is Aaron Jasinski. The Niska Yuna community coming out in full force in support of Aaron, taking swabs for a potential match, along with making big donations for Aaron and her family. We've had an incredible turnout with a diverse group of folks from young adults all the way to seniors, which is incredible because it increases the odds of finding a match. And, um, you know, like Jessica mentioned, we're not only looking for a match, but we're raising funds to help Erin's families because her medical costs are very costly. Those who organize the event are additionally selling T-shirts, hosting silent auctions to help raise those funds to support this important cause.
Final four tickets punched in high school hoops today. We'll tell you who dominated and who came up clutch in those final moments next. And now, CBS 6 Sports, sponsored by your local upstate Chevy dealers. Welcome back. Three years ago today, as the COVID-19 pandemic began, high school athletes were about to be told their season was over. What a difference here in 2023 as we see the celebration of a season continuing along with the agony defeat, but now getting to decide all of that on the court. Here we go. Quarterfinal states, Hudson Valley Community College in Class A, Indian River from Section 3, taking on defending champions, Averill Park. Taylor Holohan scores here to start the game. 2-0. How about that? She had 30 points. Just one loss for each of these teams all year long. Later in the first, Holohan down low, back out to Bailey Lane. She hits the three, 17 to six, Averill Park. Later in the half, it's 24 to eight now. Kaylee Ahern, watch this move, a little bounce to the left, step back three, it's 27 to eight. She had 10 points, it was 37-13 at the half, 64-38 the final, Averill Park moving on to the final four. In Class B, Albany Academy Bears taking on Saranac from Section 7. Both teams just one loss heading into this one. In the first, how about a pretty pick and roll? Aaron Huben to Stiliana Montzoris. It's 11-2 Albany. Next, Albany possession. Tough take here in the lane by Montezoris. Look at all of that contact. Finishing with the left. We move on later on in the first half. It's 32 to 7, Albany. They're pouring on in the corner. There's a three. Albany moving on to the final, 62 37. In Class D, Notre Dame, Bishop Gibbons, the Golden Knights, first state playoff appearance in 2019, taking on Section 7 Seton Knights. Right to the fourth, we go. Great tip off the inbounds by Mia Rose Wiley. All the way to the other end goes Angelina Dietz. Golden Knights take the lead. Seaton on the break, looking to tie it here again in the fourth. Wiley takes the charge. That's right, we show defense too. And then we have some offense. The next possession, here she is. She's open, she shoots, she scores. There's a three. They're up five, but with two minutes to go, the game is tied at 28. We go to Wiley. Again, turns, gives her team the lead. 37 to 30. The Golden Knights are moving on. How about the boys? Class B, Catholic Central out of Troy. It's first section title since 1981. Now making a state run, playing Potsdam in the quarters. Nick Riley from the outside. Nine to nothing out of the gate. Not long after that, Darian Moore here on the fast break. There's a little bounce to the left. We saw that in the girls game earlier. It's 12 nothing. He had 11 points. 27 to seven after one, and then it's Riley here after some tomfoolery in the middle of the court. He had nine points. Catholic Center moving on to the state semis for the first time ever, 72-34. Here's a good one. Eighth ranked North Warren taking on Shroon Lake in Class D. Tie game, 53-53 in the fourth. Sean Evans here gets the rebound from the far part of your screen, and then he puts it acrobat. Up and in, 55, 53, less than six to go after a Shroon Lake three, North Warren answers. Elijah Horge, nobody guarding him. He gets a three, 58, 56, North Warren. A couple minutes later, here's Horge doing what he does well. On the baseline, a little teardrop, four-point gain. That lead is three with 10 seconds to go. They need a stop. Shroon Lake needs a three. Can they get the stop? Yes, they do. 64 to 59, the final. Staying with the boys, Green Tech saw their season come to an end at the hands of Liverpool, 65-49, to the final game, and a game they never led. They will not make it back to the championship game as they did a year ago. In Class C, the Chatham boys go down to Canton, 64-59. On the girls' side, Liverpool avenges a regular season loss to Albany with a 56-51 victory. Albany finishes, though, with a 20-4 record. In Class C, the Greenwich girls jumped out to an early lead over Canton, never looked back. Now 26 and 0, they'll play in the semifinal next Saturday at Hudson Valley Community College. So as we always see the end of a season here for the, the winter sports, the spring sports, and it all corresponds with the weather. Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing about spring sports here. The weather's gonna cooperate. You get like three weeks of actual spring, but hopefully one more than that this year. That was a lot of basketball you got through there tonight. For yeah, sure. they were getting down to the end. It's cool, so cool to see these, you know, these games and some of them so sure close. Is. Some of them blowouts of this time. You gotta love it's cruising in the final four. To say the least. Uh, we've got weather that's quiet tomorrow, but get ready for a storm that looks like it's gonna be 
our biggest one that we've had all winter here at the end of the winter. We were just talking about it. We got Bruce Springsteen on Tuesday. Also, the opening of Hamilton in Schenectady on Tuesday night. We'll be keeping an eye on that for you. Thanks again for joining us tonight.